Praise the Lord. How many is ready for the word? I know that, like I said last week, it has been really good to study this letter that Paul wrote to the Christians in Rome. Let me say this too, that when we talk about, you know, breaking down scripture, it's not always the easiest thing to do. Uh, because it's written, it was written at such a different time and there was a different culture. And so you have to try to look at some of, some of those things. But I'm going to tell you, as I looked at some of that, as I was going through uh, Romans here, it's it, the things that they were dealing with, you know, were, were, yeah, they, it was really bad in terms of the persecutions that they faced for being Christians. But in terms of temptation, in terms of dealing with sin and their belief and their faith and all those things, nothing's really changed. Right. You know, Amen. as believers, we have to fight. Amen. We have to fight for the victory. Amen. And, you know, they had to do the same thing. And so Paul, in some of the language and how he talks and how he would say, he said, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin? You know, so when he's talking like that, you know, it, it, it sounds like the preachers of today, you know, the, you know, like some, some fiery preacher, you know, saying, what are you doing? What are you doing with this sin business? You know? And so Paul's addressing sin in this chapter in chapter six and having victory over it. And it's not just, oh, do good or you're going to get a slap on the wrist. I mean, there's real consequences for living in sin, which is why we want to defeat it, be victorious, put it under our feet so that it doesn't have any power over me. It doesn't have any power over you. And that's why we're looking at this here. So before we continue, let's pray. Father, this morning, we thank you for your word. I thank you for the opportunity again to speak your word. And Father, I thank you, Lord, that our hearts and our minds are just open right now, ready to receive what you have and all hindrances are gone in Jesus' name. I thank you for just a laser focus on you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So in chapter five, Paul was talking about the benefits of being justified through faith. And then in chapter six, freedom from the enslavement of sin. And that really you know, spells out what chapter six is all about is for us to be free. I love the first word, freedom. I I, I want freedom and and I don't like being bound. And I, I have, I have felt that feeling before and I don't like it. It's miserable. And that's the effects of sin and what it can do. So what I want to do is make sure that I am walking in the freedom that Christ has provided for me and he's already provided it. So Paul, when he, and I want to look at verse one again, uh, it says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? So uh, uh, really looking at this, this word, uh, you know, sin, sin is missing the mark, transgression, wrongdoing, to miss or wander from the path of uprightness and honor, breaking or defying God's commandments. Sin really though, all of sin can be described as a lack of love. And we are breaking that commandment when we sin to love others. And because wrongdoing stems from a failure to love. And one of the best descriptions of sin, I put this up on the screen last week. I'm going to look at it one more time. Sin is missing the true end and scope of our lives, which is God. And I just want us to really get a hold of that because that's like the big picture here, really, of how when we live our life, when we're, when we get sidetracked with sin, when we get bogged down in sin, We are missing what God really has for us, which is him and living in his kingdom. So we can conclude with these definitions that the essence of sin is selfishness. It's not loving others. It's pleasing oneself. It's grasping for the things and pleasures for ourselves, regardless of the welfare of others or the commandments of God. Now, this phrase, though, going back to verse one, let's look at it. Shall we continue in sin. That phrase right there, the verb tense of the phrase, continue in sin, this is the present active tense, 
which is making it clear that Paul is talking about habitually sinning. In other words, shall we continue? That's when we have this phrase continue. Should we just always be in sin so that grace can abound? And the answer to that is absolutely not. No way. You know, in the first part of Romans 6, Paul is writing about someone who is remaining in a lifestyle of sin, thinking it's acceptable for grace to abound. And he says, certainly not. That's his answer in verse 2 that we see. But now I want us to drop down to verse 15 where we pick up. And it seems like it's the same verse as verse 1. Let's look at it. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? Certainly not. And remember, he answered that certainly not in verse 2 from before. So it sounds like Paul, he's repeating himself. Is he saying the exact same thing? Well, when we look at this phrase, shall we sin? Again, the verb tense of the ancient Greek word is important. And so the aorist active tense is what we're looking at here, which indicates a dabbling in sin, not a continual habitual sin described in verse 1. So the verb in verb uh, in verse 1 is the present subjunctive. Look, I don't understand all this stuff. I'm just telling you what when I read it uh, from the experts and they tell me. And I want to pass it to you because I think it's important. So let's just do this one more time. The verb in verse 1 is the present subjunctive speaking of habitual, continuous action. That's what the verb tense is there. The verb tense in verse 15 is the aorist subjunctive referring to a single act. Okay, so Paul's answer to occasional sin, though, is the same as habitual sin, which is, guess what? Certainly not. (laughs) So regardless of whether or not we're talking about habitual sin or we're talking about occasional sin, he's covering it all. And so he's not repeating himself just for emphasis what he's saying. He's covering all the bases because he can hear what they're thinking. See? And see, after chapter 5, and you read it, and you begin to look through, and how he starts chapter 6, you can can just see that, boy, he's he's covering it, man. He's he's hitting right where they're thinking, which is, you know, all the legalists, let's hit them right between the eyes right now. Now we're we're moving on from the legalists a little bit, and we're covering everybody who thinks, you know, who that lie, and I know you've heard it. I've heard it before, too. Oh, it's just one time. Come on now. If you don't have your hand up on that, you're lying. I mean, everybody's heard that one. Amen. It's just one time. Oh, it'll just be just this once. I, you know, you've heard that voice. I know I've heard that voice. And what does Paul, though, say about it? Certainly not. No, not occasionally sinning, not habitually sinning, not sinning at all. Certainly not. And in the verses 16 and 17, he gives us the spiritual principles that we need to understand when we're answering this question. Because see, he's, he's going back again, and it's kind of almost the same format as the, the first half of chapter 6. But he's answering this question of occasionally sinning, giving into that voice that says, oh, it's just one time. Okay. So he's answering this question, and then he says in verse 16, Do you not know that whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are the one's slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? Verse 17, But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. Mm, I like that. I like the... uh, You were delivered. When we were saved, we were delivered, set free, hallelujah, from the captivity of sin. We no longer have to give in to it. Amen. So I love that part. Now, in verse 16, though, when he's talking here, whatever you present yourself to obey, you become its slave. For example, if I obey my appetite constantly, even when I know I shouldn't eat, you know, and so I'm eating all day. It's like every time I'm just snacking, I'm just going because I'm obeying uh, my appetite. I'm now a slave to my appetite because I am a slave to it. It's controlling me when I can't control it. And I feel just a little tiny bit of hunger and I go in there and go get something to eat. Now, I'm not talking like well, my son, Aaron, now he eats all day long, but he's an athlete and he's a growing young man. So now he needs to eat. Talking about you adults, your metabolism's not what it used to be. You cannot obey your appetite like always. I mean, it's just that simple. Now, I know during this coronavirus, it can be tough because we're all sitting at home and the kitchen's just right there. 
Anyways, the point is, if we're always obeying that, then I'm a slave to it. If I'm always obeying the sin, the need to say whether it's pornography or whatever it is, and it's drawing and it's just, and it's all the time and it's there and I feel that, oh, I need to do that, you know, what am I, uh, I'm a slave to it. I don't have it conquered. It's not under my feet. So we need to understand that sin is a personal power that can enslave and deceive. Look at what the writer of Hebrews says. If you don't believe me, here, here it is. But exhort one another daily while it's called today. Lest any, of you, lest any of you be hardened through the what? The deceitfulness of sin. Sin is very deceitful. It wants you under its thumb. It is a personal power to enslave. One way or another, we're going to serve somebody. The option to live our life without serving either sin or obedience isn't open to us. We have got to choose one way or another. And I choose obedience. Amen? Amen. I'm not choosing sin. Now, this phrase, though you were slaves to sin. I love this in verse 17 because Paul puts it in the past tense. He says were. Just like he did earlier in chapter 6 when he was talking about habitual sin. Now he's talking about occasional. Look, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You need to remember that you were slaves of sin. You're no longer. So rise above, church. Rise above, you Christian. Rise above, you child of God. Rise above, you that has been washed in the blood. Hallelujah. Amen. Rise above. Right? So that's what Paul's saying. He puts it in the past tense because we've been freed from our slavery to sin. He also says that we've been set free by faith, which he describes as obedience from the heart. Do you notice that? Because see, that's faith. But look, if I'm not obeying from the heart, it's not faith. If I'm just doing it just, oh, because, no. I need to put my faith in God and his word. And now I'm set free. When I do that, when I have that faith and I believe that, now I'm living every day constant with that freedom. That freedom is now mine. It belongs to me because I understand I was. It, it, it's in the past. Were. Paul says were. Hallelujah. We were slaves to sin. No longer. Obeyed from the heart is a wonderful description of faith. And why? It, because it shows that faith comes from the heart. It's not just from the mind. If you tried to beat sin with just your mind, good luck. It, the mind is where the battleground is. You need you, who God made you, to come out from your heart to rise above. That's what you need. Look, faith results in obedience because if we really believe something, we will act according to that belief. I, and that's, that's, that's where the faith is. Faith comes from the heart, not just the mind. It shows that faith results in obedience. Let me put it this way. Those of us who have children and when they're really little, you know, you can look at them and you ask them if they did what they were supposed to. Did you clean your room? And you can tell it's, it's, it's always, it's one thing, one thing it's been for me and all four of my children, it has been true. And I have known whether or not they were telling the truth, the eyes, every single time when I ask the question, if they look down and look away <laughs> as they're answering, something's wrong. I'm getting a partial picture. You know, I ain't getting the full picture. Well, yeah, I cleaned my room, but yeah, you shoved it all under the bed, didn't you? <laughs> you just shoved it in the closet so I couldn't see it. Something was wrong because of the eyes. I could tell. See, you know when it's happening. We will act according to what we really believe. Right. Do you believe that you are the head and not the tail? Do you believe that you are more than a conqueror? Do you believe that that old man is dead? Do you believe that? Mm. This phrase in verse 17, 
that form of doctrine, right after obey from heart, that form of doctrine, this phrase is part of a beautiful picture. The word form describes a mold used to shape in molden, molten metal. So it, it, get this. It describes a mold mm, used to shape metal. And that's what this is. That form of doctrine. What is it that you believe? What doctrine is it that you believe? What, what, what are your beliefs? The idea is that God, I, I believe here with this, that God wants to shape us. He first melts us through the work of the Holy Spirit. He pricks us in our heart when we're supposed to, we're, you know, and it doesn't always feel good, you know, when the Holy Spirit pricks you. But see, we need that so that we can be shaped in his image. Amen. We have to see that. See, as we've seen earlier in Romans 6, we can be legally free and still choose to live like a prisoner. That's right. We can do that. We can be legally free, but still choose to live like a prisoner. Paul has a simple command and encouragement for the, the Christian. When you look here at, at verse 17 and what he's saying, he's saying you were. Okay. He's talking about who you are. So look at this phrase right here. Be who you are. I don't know, Darren, do we have that? Be who you are. Now I, I put this up here because why? This is important because whenever we sin, we're going back to who we were instead of being who we are right now. Because see, whenever we sin, we're going back. And Paul said, no, that's the past. That's over with. So you need to be who you are right now, which is a child of God, which is the head, not the tail in the family of God. You are the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. Therefore, be that. Be that. This is what Paul is saying. And then in verse 18, he says this, sin is no longer our master. That's really what he's talking about in verse 18. Let's read it. And having being been set free from sin, you become slaves of righteousness. Now, <laughs> now get this. What does it mean to be free from sin and become a slave to righteousness? It means sin is no longer your boss. That's really what it means. You want to be a slave to righteousness, even though, you know, that terminology kind of bothers us or it can, you know, because of current, you know, events and things like that. But understand Righteousness is really where the freedom is. And that's what Paul is saying. Mm. Right now, righteousness is supposed to be your boss. So serve righteousness instead of sin. That's not always easy because sin wants to be the boss and a horrific boss at that. Think of the worst boss you've ever had times 10, right? That's sin. It's horrific. Ed Cole says this about sin. All sin promises to serve and please, but only desires to enslave and dominate. This is so important for us to understand. Because when we get that little, oh, it's just that one time. Oh, you deserve it, or you know you want that, or you need that, or da, da, da. just whatever it is. It's no biggie. It'll just be one, and you'll get back on track after. You always do. You know, look, I've heard it all. I've heard it all, and I know you've heard it as well. We are set free from sin. That means you never have to sin again. Now, even though because all men, all men have come short of the glory of God, we know that they sin because of weakness. Every, every man does because of weakness, and we get it. We understand that, but that doesn't mean you have to. God hasn't designed some system for you that, that, that you have to sin. He didn't design that. When the enemy says, oh, God set this all up and he knows you're going to sin anyway, so it's okay. No, that's not how he set it up. He set it up so you and I could be free, that we could live in righteousness. Verses 19 through 23, how to keep from enslaving ourselves. How to keep from enslaving ourselves. And, and let, really pay attention to this here. Verse 19, I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness and of lawlessness leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. What fruit did you have 
then in the things of which you are now ashamed. For the end of those things is death. But now, having been, been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Very popular verse, part of the Romans road that so many of us know. But let's go back up to verse 19. I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. The Apostle Paul is explaining how he feels it's necessary to use slavery as an illustration. That he's not really wanting to, but he's doing it because he believes that he needs to. He knew that slavery was degrading, pervasive, but he also knew that many of his Roman readers were slaves. Yet he knew this was an accurate and meaningful illustration, even though he really didn't want to. He speaks in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. So you, in other words, so you can understand. In verse 19, we see lawlessness leading to more lawlessness. Paul here, he's describing a principle ingrained in human nature. Lawlessness leads to more lawlessness. Righteousness leads to holiness, which is more righteousness. Get this. If lawlessness leads to more lawlessness, then righteousness and holiness leads to more righteousness. This describes the dynamic power of our habits. <laughs> when we start thinking about it, we get... It's easy to get into a habit. Amen. I get into I can get to the habit of waking up every day at the same time. I can. You know, if you go to bed around about the same t time, you're going to start waking up round about the same time. Now, I get it that sometimes there's issues and things or whatever, but I'm just saying in general, your body can train and, be, and it can become a habit and you can train your body. It can become such a habit for so many of you that wake up. You, and I've heard this phrase, I can't do anything without my coffee. You know, you know, the coffee drink, all you coffee drinkers, you know who you are. You can't do anything. You have to wake up. You got to get your coffee. And now I'm awake. My daughter comes downstairs. It looks like toothpicks are barely holding up her eyes. And she's coming down here getting her iced coffee. She likes it cold. I don't know why. She, that's just how she likes it. And she puts herself some chocolate syrup in that thing. So she puts it in there and she just drinks that every single day. Yeah, I'm telling on you, Sarah, but... But what does it do? It's a good habit for her because it, it helps her. You know, it helps her in the morning. There's nothing wrong with that habit. But see, when the enemy comes in and he wants to get a stronghold in your life, he's going to try to set you up with a bad habit. And that's where we have to understand that lawlessness leads to more lawlessness. Therefore, righteousness leads to holiness, which is more righteous. I want you to think about Four trees that are in a row. One tree has only been there six months. The second tree's been there for two years. The third tree has been there for five years. And then the fourth tree has been there for ten years. Which tree's the biggest? It's not a trick question. <laughs> it's the one that's been there for ten years. It's huge. And if you allow a bad habit to develop and you've been doing that for 10 years, that means you got a fight on your hands. We need to understand that. Because see, these things, everything you do in life is a seed. Everything you do in life is a seed. I, I mean, we're laying up treasures in heaven is what Christ said. Everything we do, every action. So, what am I building my, and what am I growing my roots into? Is it the word of God and into righteousness and into holiness? Or am I getting tripped up by the enemy and getting tripped up with this sin or this, this sin over here? Rather than being attached to the vine, which Jesus said, I am the vine and you are the branches. That's where our life is from. We get our life from. It's from Jesus. That's life. Amen. Mm. The tree that's the most difficult to pull out of the ground is the one that's been there for 10 years. So the longer that we're rooted in a behavior, the harder it is to uproot it. It's kind of like those, those weeds that I hate pulling. I hate pulling those weeds. And if you wait too long, you can't even pull it out by hand. You got to dig it out. And if you just cut it off, guess what? It's going gonna, it's gonna to come back. 
See, you cut sin off, but then after that, you got to grow some new roots. Mm hmm. So see, you got to grow roots into the word of God. So, so many times we're like, oh, I'm not doing that again. I'm set free. I'm victorious. Hallelujah. And the next thing you know, the next week, we're right back in it. And you're like, and then you're going, how did I do it again? Why? I feel so awful. I know. I was, it was done. I have been there over and over and over. And you know what it was? I didn't grow my roots down into Jesus. I didn't grow my, grow my roots into the word of God. Because see, when you do that, now when the enemy comes, there's no room. You've outgrown him. Amen. 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 It's time to grow roots. It's time to grow up. A Amen. Verse 20, for when you were slaves... Of sin, you were freed in regard to righteousness. Here, Paul's point is almost humorous. When we were slaves of sin, we were free, all right, free in regard to righteousness. You know, yeah, the, the, but that's where the freedom is. That's where the freedom is, is in righteousness. And then verse 21, he says, what fruit did you have then to walk in victory over sin? We must think rightly about the fruit of sin. We need to understand that when we sin, we're bearing fruit. And it's not the good kind. Mm. To say the end of those things is death. When we see that in the scripture, the end of those things is death. Is that here? Yeah, in verse 21. That means the end product of sin is, is death. It's over. But see, when that happens, when we've had a 10-year route, it's not fun. It's hard work. I've cut down trees and tried to get roots out of a big tree that big around. It's, you know, compared to the little small tree, it's a lot different. It's a lot easier. It's a lot faster lopping those things down. But see, I want to read this out of my notes because see, the end product of righteousness is everlasting life. Let me read this. In a time of temptation, these truths can seem, these truths can seem unreal. So we must rely on God's word. When we are tempted, faith reminds us of the bitter fruit of sin when our feelings may forget that bitter fruit. And see, that's what happens. We start giving into the voice again and we forgot how we felt after the first time when we did it. And that's why Paul is saying, remember. You need to remember what it felt like. What fruit did you have then? What fruit was it? It didn't feel too good. Remember that. This is church, this is what helps us to get free of sin. Whether it's habitual sin or occasional sin or sin in general, this is our way to be free. And in verse 23, we see the wages of sin is death. When you work for sin, the wages, uh, it's death. Every time. When we serve God, we get no literal pay per se, but he freely gives us the best benefit package Ever, everlasting life. And my everlasting life begins now. And the life that I live is supposed to be one of victory. You know, this word death in the widest sense means comprising of all the miseries arising from sin. And it also means physical death. It has a dual meaning. So in other words, the wages of sin is now and later. Are you here? We have to understand that, which is why we need Jesus. We get the salvation, which then our righteousness is now and it's later. See, without Jesus, without his righteousness, we can't stand before a holy God. But we can stand before him because of the righteousness of Christ. Paul's made it clear, as believers, we have a change of ownership. We're to serve Jesus as our Lord. Not just our Savior, but as our Lord. We're to be slaves to righteousness, but that's where the freedom is. It sounds like, oh, I don't know about that. Oh, no, no. That's glorious. 
Because see, serving him, there is nothing like serving my God. Nothing like serving him. But it's awful dealing with sin and serving sin. So if you're listening today, and it, you know, I'm, I'm done. There's more I can say. I, mm, this chapter, if you're dealing with sin, this is your chapter. You can have newness of life, as Paul says. You can walk in it every day. You can walk in newness of life. Just understand what sin is, the power of sin, what, it, what, it's, what the enemy's uh, trying to accomplish by that, the temptations, and understand the fruit of righteousness and how much better it tastes. I'm going to tell you one thing, and that a little food example. I always have you know, a lot of these food examples. Uh, but I remember years ago, and uh, I was going to Nova, so this is a long time ago, and my diet was terrible. I may have shared this before, said what it was, but I was eating sugar cereal in the morning. I would eat my mom's lunch before lunch, buy the school's lunch, and buy the school dessert, of course, come home after, get me a snack of some sort, and sometimes it was a candy bar, you know, I did these things, whether it was Nova High School. You know, I just, I ate a lot. My metabolism was high. But Nova, I started slowing down on some of that. But what increased was my sugar intake because I got away from mama sometimes. Mm -hmm. Mama didn't want me eating the sugar. But see, I was over here at Nova buying that stuff with my money that I worked, you know, for. So I got myself a candy bar. I got myself a soda. Oh, and I had me some ice cream that night. So my diet was really bad for a while. And so when I went without food, I would start to get nauseated. I wouldn't feel too good, all of that. So the sugar was affecting me and affecting my, my blood. So the doctor said I had hypoglycemia and I need to stop eating this sugar. Boy, it was hard. It was so hard getting off that sugar. I, I wanted it so bad. My body craved it, but I dropped it cold turkey. I had a headache for two or three days. So I dropped sugar for two weeks. I mean, totally dropped it. And then I noticed something that I didn't notice on day one. When I bit into a citrus orange, oh my goodness, it tasted so much better two weeks later than it did the day after when I was dropping the sugar. Because like, you know, the ways they give you tips. How are you going to drop the sugar? You got to replace it with something else, you know, that, that could be sweet that you could eat. You know, it's natural. You know, that's what they said. You start with that. So I'm eating these oranges. And they, I mean, they just weren't all that good. And the next thing you know, week number, I get to the end of the second week. I bit into that orange and realized this is like candy. Because I hadn't eaten that refined sugar for like two weeks straight. I mean, I cut it all out. And I realized how good the orange really was. When we're in the depths of sin, sometimes we don't know how bad the condition is that we're in until we get over and we've tasted the fruit of righteousness and we continue to taste it. How much lighter in my spirit that I feel, how much better in my spirit I feel, how much of God's presence now that I feel that I didn't feel before because I was putting up a barrier between me and God and me and God, we weren't like this. I needed that barrier dropped from, of sin. I needed that barrier to come down. So I could feel his presence like I'd never felt before. When sin was rooted out of my life, mm, there's nothing like living righteously. Amen. Let's pray and let's say to God, God, I want to live righteously before you. No habitual sin, no occasional sin, no nothing. I want to live free. I want to live free. Hallelujah. Father God, right now, Lord, we submit ourselves to you and we say no to sin. Just as Paul said, certainly not. We say, God forbid, certainly not. We say no to sin. Hallelujah. The stronghold of sin right now. And if you have that stronghold, say, just come against it right now in the name of Jesus, that stronghold in your life. I come against that right now. And you name it and you put it under your feet, whatever it is. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. Lord, and we say that we're going to have newness of life. We're going to walk in newness of life.
Lord, may we taste your fruit and see that it is good and continue in it. And may we continue, Lord, and loving, Lord, and loving others. Lord, that your fruit would just remain, Lord, in us as we're connected to that vine, which is you. Father, I thank you for it, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that your word, Lord, is true. And we stand on it now, here today. And we will walk in who we are now and not in who we were. Because that old man is dead. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.